On June 14, 2022, the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project hosted an in-person event on regulating the new crypto ecosystem. The event featured remarks from SEC Commissioner Hester M. Peirce. The following are those remarks. Please enjoy. We are happy that you have joined us for today's event, the new crypto ecosystem, necessary regulation, or crippling future innovation. We look forward to remarks today from SEC Commissioner Hester M. Peirce and the panel to follow. Check out future events and content at regproject.org. That's regproject.org. First, I would like to introduce today's moderator, J.W. Verrett, who is the chair of the Regulatory Transparency Project's Financial Services and Corporate Governance Working Group. J.W. is an expert in banking, securities, and corporate law. He teaches on those topics at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University. He is a graduate of Louisiana State University, Harvard Law School, and the Kennedy School of Government. I encourage you to read more about all of JW's many contributions and accomplishments online at fedsoc.org. JW, I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, appreciate that. As I introduce today's discussion, I wanna ask a question. I'll open with a quick question. Why do we care about crypto, cryptocurrency? Why do we care? Do we care because it's the next big thing? <clears throat> do we care because of the celebrity endorsements, Super Bowl ads? No. Do we care because it's the next thing to speculate on and we like when number goes up? A little bit, yes, absolutely. But let me submit that the reason why at least I care and why I think we should care is because of the central tenet of this new burgeoning industry which seems to me to be that decentralized computing power can translate to decentralized economic and political power. If economic transactions or communications can take place in a peer-to-peer -peer way, of course peer-to-peer -peer predated crypto, but now blockchain applications can really make it, make it sing. If economic transactions can take place in a way that is computed across decentralized computers, thousands of them across the globe, then there is no central party that can stop that transaction from taking place, that can censor economic transactions between willing parties, or that can charge economic rents for the privilege of doing so. And when that decentralized computing power translates to decentralized economic and political power, it empowers the individual. And in that way, <clears throat> I think FedSoc has a lot in common with crypto, actually. First of all, FedSoc operates in a decentralized way, right? We're a decentralized group. The practice groups create the programming. Gene and Dean are here to help facilitate, as they'll probably tell you. Uh, and they do a great job. And by the way, thanks to all of our FedSoc team here for helping set this up. But that's how they operate. But even more importantly, let's remember the book we all revere that FedSoc's named after. The Federalist Papers is a book about decentralized power, isn't it? It's a book about decentralized power at the federal level, separation of powers, keeping all three branches in check. And more importantly, it's a book about the decentralization of power through recognizing the states as sovereign in the constitutional structure. The states as laboratories of democracy, laboratories of economic invention. I think the founders today would have loved crypto if they were alive. No question but that Ben Franklin would have a crypto project he'd be hawking in the tavern in Pennsylvania. No question, but that Thomas Jefferson would have some crypto application for agricultural processes or for trade. Alexander Hamilton would have been all over. He would have had a crypto exchange, right? Or a crypto bank. Um, so I think all of these things are fascinating. Now, what's the threat to crypto right now? That not all projects lived up to that ideal, right? Some of them are very centralized. Some of them are very centralized scams. Some of them are centralized, earnest attempts that have horrible operational security and a lot of hacks. Believe me, I know about all of these because I've been a prolific investor in many of them. On the other hand, so what's, what's to do about that? On the other hand, <clears throat> I teach the 33 Act, the Securities Act of 1933. It's the one thing I know a lot about. App 
simple cookie cutter application of the 33 Act to crypto brings on some incredibly ridiculous consequences. We laugh about it in securities class, my students laugh about it. Treating a kid running a miner in their basement or a validator in their basement is treated like an underwriter for the purposes of the securities laws. The same regulatory regime for JP Morgan will apply to that kid in their basement. Utterly ridiculous. So what's to be done about this? How to balance investor protection with investor innovation and investor freedom to help to facilitate this movement that's all about decentralization of power. I know of no one in the world who spent more time thinking about balancing that balance with more technical skill, with more uh, commitment to both investor protection and investor freedom and opportunity than Commissioner Purse. That's why I'm, it's my great privilege to introduce her today to today's discussion. We'll have a discussion panel that follows. Those in the audience, get ready. The commissioner loves to take a few questions. Our panel will love to get a few questions as well. Commissioner Purse needs no introduction. She's been around FedSoc events for a while, but I'll just offer. Uh, before she served on the commission for a number of years and has been a thought leader on cryptocurrency regulation through dissents and speeches and um, in a number of venues, uh, she served as, a, as a, a, a scholar at the Mercatus Center. She's been counsel to the Senate Banking Committee during the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, she's been counsel to Commissioner Atkins and counsel in the SEC for over a decade. Um, let me stop talking here because you know who we're here to listen to. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Hester Peirce. Thanks, JW. I think it's nice to have that kind of broad overview. I'm going to be talking about a much more specific issue today, and so I think it's good to keep bear in mind that broader, um, more conceptual uh, framework. And I want to thank the Federalist Society, the Regulatory Transparency Project, for the chance to be with you all today. The topic of today's event is regulating the new crypto ecosystem. And that's certainly a very hot topic of, of conversation in, in Washington these days. And it reminds me of this book. Um, it's a children's book, but it's, it's a book called Are You My Mother? And it's about a little bird who um, is, he, he, the bird hatches. His mother's run out or flown out to, to go pick up a worm for him. And so when he hatches, he's there all by himself, no mom. And so he hops down from the tree. He doesn't know how to fly yet. So he's walking around and checking in with different potential mothers. And um, so first, you know, goes up to a cat. And the cat says, I'm, not, I'm a cat. I'm not your mother. Goes to a, a, a dog and a hen and a cow and even a front-end loader. No, Mom. The front-end loader does, the, does him the service of putting him back in the nest. So when the mom comes back, um, baby bird and, and, and his actual mother are reunited and he knows right away that's his mom. So the crypto industry is on a similar journey. It doesn't seem to be in, in need of a mother, um, but it is out looking for a regulator. And I feel like it's a, it's, it's, it's a similar search, keeps going up to different regulators and, and asking, are you my regulator? Um, but there's a bureaucratic twist on it. It's Washington, right? So, of course, every regulator says, oh, yeah, I'm your regulator. Um, so everyone is claiming to be the, the regulator of, of crypto. And so crypto is looking to Congress to kind of sort these things out, figure out who is actually the regulator. Um, and there was a bipartisan bill that got a lot of attention uh, last week, was, was introduced, um, and it, it attempts to answer that question. Some people in the crypto industry are celebrating because they like the allocation of power in that, in that bill. Um, certain authorities are at the SEC, but certain other authorities are at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And a lot of people are happy that more of the, of the authorities didn't end up at the uh, at the SEC because they've been really disappointed at how my agency, the SEC, has interacted with the crypto industry and has regulated crypto. And I understand and share that disappointment, but I'm hopeful that we can change course and use our existing authorities better and any authorities that Congress might give to us through um, new legislation, I hope that we'll use that authority better as well. 
Watching the SEC refuse over the past four years, which is how long I've been there, to engage productively with crypto users and developers has prompted feelings of disbelief at the SEC's puzzling and I think out of character approach to regulation. The Commission, of course, has occasionally explained its actions or its inactions, but those explanations have often been confusing, inconsistent, and unhelpful. I've communicated my discomfort with the Commission's behavior to my colleagues, to the public, and the results to date seem to be about the same as they've been over the past four years, which is poor. Um, we continue to brush off the crypto, in, crypto products and services without a consideration for the consequences of what we're doing. And so I want to talk about one concrete example today, uh, and that's the Commission's persistent refusal to approve a spot Bitcoin exchange-traded product. But of course, I've got to give you my disclaimers before going any further. And so the first is the standard disclaimer that I always give, which is that my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. But I want to give you some other disclaimers, too. This speech is not an endorsement of Bitcoin, Bitcoin exchange-traded products, or any other crypto-related asset. People exercising skepticism great enough to quell the dangerous, dangerously seductive fear of missing out, JW, that's for you, um, should choose what to put in their portfolios when and in what quantities. Whether assisted by a financial professional or flying solo, investors should in invest based on, the, on factors such as their own present and anticipated future circumstances, informed risk assessments of the assets they're considering buying and the portfolio in which those assets will sit, and a candid assessment of their stomach for market volatility and financial loss. They should be aware, as recent events have reminded us, that past performance is no guarantee of future performance. And people shouldn't look to regulators to make decisions for them. And regulators should not seek to play that role themselves. My third disclaimer is that although many of the early Bitcoin exchange traded product denials were issued by the staff under authority delegated from, com from the commission, my criticism about these denials and about other policy decisions are, not, are leveled at the commission and not at the staff. The staff is appropriately following the lead that it's getting from the commission, but the commission has not been leading well. The commission's resistance to a spot Bitcoin ETP is becoming almost legendary. When is the commission gonna approve a Bitcoin ETP is the most common question that I've gotten in my entire tenure at the SEC. It continues to be the most frequent question. And my answer has, has tended to be, you know, a disappointed, I have no idea, um, the Bitcoin is, is a relatively new asset, uh, but the concept, the concept of affording access to commodities through an exchange-traded product is not new. The Commission long has allowed investors to gain exposure to a number of non-securities instruments through pooled investment vehicles. And this, that's been a boon to investors as their shares trade continually on national stock exchanges at market prices, much as a regular stock would trade. Through a process of creating and redeeming shares of the fund, institutional uh, traders called authorized participants play an important role in keeping the price of these shares in line with the price of assets in the investment pool. The Commission has added crypto-specific hurdles to what used to be fairly straightforward processes for approving these pooled investment vehicles, whether exchange-traded funds under the Investment Company Act or exchange-traded products under the Securities Act. Indeed, although in the past eight months, both ETFs and ETPs based on Bitcoin futures have made it through, the Commission has continued to, to disapprove ETPs based on the spot Bitcoin market. The reasons for this resistance to a spot product are difficult to understand, apart from a recognition that the Commission has determined to subject anything related to Bitcoin and presumably other digital assets to a more exacting standard than it applies to other products. In a 2018 letter, for example, the staff in the Division of Investment Management expressed a willingness to engage with um, fund sponsors interested in incorporating crypto assets into their funds, but it outlined, quote, significant outstanding questions concerning how funds holding substantial amounts of cryptocurrencies and related products would satisfy the requirement of the 1940 Act and its rules. Those questions related to custody, valuation, liquidity, the arbitrage mechanism for ETFs and manipulation and other risks. 
Asking these questions isn't inherently problematic and might even be characterized as positive because it sparks thinking about really important questions. But the commission gave very few explicit external indications of progress on grappling with, with these issues, let alone resolving them. Retail funds that tried to incorporate exposure to Bitcoin into their portfolios encountered a series of challenges. The disclosure review process plays an important investor protection role, but the commission has many polite ways of exercising merit regulation, often without a clear legal basis for doing so. Certain funds looked for ways to get exposure to Bitcoin for their investors, such as holding over-the-counter products, companies with crypto exposure, or putting small sleeves of Bitcoin futures into their portfolios. Closed-end funds, which don't provide daily redemption, were the first to, um, to be able to incorporate Bitcoin futures. But even as late as May 2021, the staff reminded closed-end funds seeking to invest in, Bit in the Bitcoin futures market to consult with the staff prior to filing a registration statement about the fund's proposed investment, anticipated compliance with the Investment Company Act and its rules, and how the fund would provide for appropriate investor protection. Now, this is unusual because there's no requirement that you seek approval before you, before you make a filing. And with respect to open-end funds, the statement warned that the staff would monitor the quality of the underlying Bitcoin futures market and funds ongoing compliance with the Investment Company Act and the rules thereunder and the other federal securities laws. Again, this is very unusual because you've got to remember when you file something, what, what the SEC is looking for is they're looking to make sure that your disclosures match what you're actually doing. But here, um, the, the commission was taking a step beyond that and it's saying it's watching what's happening in the markets. Again, not a problem that it's watching what happens in the markets, but what my issue with what was going on, it, it was an attempt to step into the shoes of the marketplace to assess whether a product would work, then we've gone too far. That's up to the market to decide. We just have to make sure the disclosures are right and then let the market figure it out. Although a number of funds managed to hold Bitcoin futures, many sponsors wanted to provide exposure to Bitcoin in an exchange-traded form. The commission continued to signal to would-be sponsors of such products, don't file. In October 2021, however, everything changed. Um, the, the SEC finally allowed futures Bitcoin, um, futures-based Bitcoin ETFs to start trading. And what, what made that change? Well, Chair Gensler gave a speech in which he gave a signal saying, I think um, a product under the Investment Company Act with futures, Bitcoin futures in it would be okay. Um, and he cited, he cited the fact that the CFTC oversees the, fut the futures market and that this Investment Company Act, um, these Investment Company Act protections that come with an ETF would make him comfortable. And so some of these funds started trading, they proved popular, but demand for a spot-based product continued to be out there because fund products, uh, futures products are, are more expensive um, and difficult to manage and they don't necessarily track as closely the spot price. So until this year, all of these products, the futures exchange traded products, were under the Investment Company Act, which is the one that has these protections for investors. Um, and in April, there was a new, a new development, which was that the commission approved the first ETP holding Bitcoin futures under the Securities Act. And so that implicitly acknowledged that the protections afforded by the Investment Company Act are not relevant to the question of whether approval under the Exchange Act is appropriate. The protections the Investment Company Act affords are as industry commenters have highlighted, designed and intended to protect investors against self-interested managers. It really has nothing to do with how the product trades. In other words, as, a number, as, as another commenter described, the, the 1940 Act's protections do not address and thus are not relevant to the concern the Commission has repeatedly invoked when it's denying spot-based Bitcoin exchange-traded products. And those concerns are market manipulation and fraud in the underlying Bitcoin market. Some of the observers found this development a notable development because spot-based products would be also under the Securities Act rather than the Investment Company Act. 
Um, but the commission still has not approved any ETP based on the spot Bitcoin market. Despite the su success of futures-based ETP applicants over the past eight months, using the same tired reasoning, the commission keeps denying spot Bitcoin ETPs. The commission requires an applicant, which is the exchange on which the ETP is, is going to trade, um, that that applicant has to come in and show that its proposal is consistent with the requirements of Exchange Act Section 6B5, and in particular, with the requirement that the rules of a national securities exchange be designed to prevent fraudulent and manipulative acts and practices, and to protect investors in the public interest. In demonstrating consistency with Section 6B5, the exchange applying to list the ETP has a choice. It can either show a surveillance agreement or a unique resistance to manipulation. The first option is for the exchange to show that it has a comprehensive surveillance sharing agreement with a regulated market or a group of markets of significant size. An acceptable surveillance sharing agreement would provide for the unimpeded sharing of information about market trading activity, clearing activity, and customer identity. Significant market size is determined, for example, by showing a reasonable likelihood that a person attempting to manipulate the ETP would have to trade on that market to successfully manipulate the ETP. Only then would a surveillance sharing agreement assist in detecting and, de and deterring misconduct. One way that a market could count as being of, sig of, being of significant size is if it's reasonably likely that a person seeking to manipulate the ETP would also have to trade on that market to succeed in doing so, and if trading in the ETP would be unlikely to be the predominant influence on prices in the market. So this is all very technical, but this is the kind of procedures that people have to get through. So another option would be the exchange seeking to list the ETP could show that the underlying Bitcoin markets are uniquely re resistant to fraud and manipulation. The standard requires a level of resistance higher than what exists in traditional commodity markets or equity markets. According to a majority of the commission, no exchange successfully has made the case under either approach. An ETP disapproval order issued last month embodies the, the now standard rationale. The exchange here opted for alternative two, showing that the Bitcoin markets are uniquely resistant to fraud and man manipulation. And the commission said, as with the previous proposals, the commission here concludes that the exchange's assertions about the general liquidity growth and acceptance of the Bitcoin market do not constitute other means to prevent fraud and manipulation sufficient to justify dispensing with the requisite surveillance sharing agreement. While the exchange states that, that the significant liquidity in the spot market and resultant minimal impact of market orders on the overall price of Bitcoin mitigates the risks associated with potential manipulation, such assertion is general and conclusory. End of story. The, reason, the reasoning, though, underlying the Commission's denials of spot Bitcoin ETPs is, in my view, general and conclusory, which makes it difficult to know how approval could ever be achieved. The commission doesn't really grapple with the important characteristics of these products and the underlying spot markets, including the widely distributed nature of trading in Bitcoin and the methods used by these ETPs to um, calculate the underlying, uh, to calculate the net asset value. It doesn't take into account the evidence from other jurisdictions where regulators have approved similar products. Absent a wholesale rejection of the standard analysis, how does the commission put itself in a position where it could approve these products? With each new disapproval, the SEC doubles down on its reasoning. The continuing refusal of the SEC to approve a spot Bitcoin ETP is puzzling not only to me, but to many agency observers. The Bitcoin market has grown, matured, become more liquid, and attracted more and more sophisticated in the TradFi, um, traditional financial market sense of the word, participants. At 13 years old, as of about an hour or so ago, which may have changed, Bitcoin has a market cap of, of approximately $430 billion and is trading at around $22,500. Bitcoin in investors comprise natural persons and institutions, um, and including regulated market participants. Many insurance companies, asset managers, university endowments, pension funds, large banks, and public companies have invested in Bitcoin or are considering doing so. Increasingly sophisticated infrastructure has built up around Bitcoin and crypto markets more generally. Like the traditional financial market, uh, market landscape, 
The crypto terrain is dotted with trading platforms, trading firms, venture capital firms, hedge funds, law firms, and accounting firms. In contrast to 2018, when the Division of Investment Management noted there was an absence of custodians in the space, um, custodians now compete to offer their services. A cornerstone of institutional participation, the Bitcoin futures market, has been up and running since 2017. And that's, um, that's a, a, a vibrant market now with, um, with open interest hovering around $1.7 billion. Spot ETPs have launched in other countries uh, without, great, with, without incident, but with great investor interest. In Canada, for example, the first spot Bitcoin ETP reached a billion Canadian dollars um, within a month of its launch. Spot crypto ETPs are also popular in Europe. Were there more than 70 crypto ETPs with an estimated total of 7 billion in assets? ETPs in these other jurisdictions have functioned even in volatile market conditions. So why is the SEC a holdout? At what point, if any, does, increasing does the increasing maturity of the Bitcoin markets and the success of similar products elsewhere tip the scale in favor of approval? Of course, the facts and circumstances of each application matter. But will I ever stop hearing that question that I keep hearing when a, Bitcoin ET when a spot Bitcoin ETP? The approval of futures-based products, first under the Investment Company Act and more recently of a similar Securities Act product for listing and trading under the Exchange Act, might appear to open a door to changing the approach that we've taken. Um, but the language of these orders provides precious little basis for optimism that the Commission will approve a spot Bitcoin product. The futures base, and again, I don't have any insight. I'm just saying I'm reading the same orders everyone else is reading. The futures-based approvals turn on the regulated nature of the futures market, the CME, which is where assets held by the ETPs themselves trade. The commission explains somewhat tautologically that the CME can reasonably be relied on to capture the effects on the CME Bitcoin futures market caused by a person attempting to manipulate the proposed futures ETP by manipulating the price of CME Bitcoin futures contracts. A little hard to follow, but that's kind of standard uh, fare for these ETP um, uh, approvals or denials. The reasoning obviously doesn't apply to spot-based products, and it's difficult to see how it's even relevant for an instrument that trades on hundreds of exchanges worldwide. It's true that in these approvals, the Commission reiterated its position that its concerns about the lack of a surveillance sharing agreement and filings seeking to list and trade spot-based ETPs could be addressed by demonstrating that there is a reasonable likelihood that a person attempting to manipulate the spot Bitcoin ETP would also have to trade on CME, which is the futures exchange. But the Commission also went out of its way to state that the evidence doesn't demonstrate that this type of connection between the two markets exists, an observation that wasn't necessary, it was kind of dicta um, to the Commission's approval of, of the futures-based ETPs. Perhaps the Commission could be persuaded that the similarity of pricing mechanisms for the futures-based product and the spot-based product undermines its rationale for treating them differently. The Commission's willingness to be persuaded, though, turns on whether the Commission's primary concern is legal and logical coherence with our approvals of Bitcoin futures products and other commodity-based products, um, and not, say, using the prospect of a spot Bitcoin ETP approval as an inducement to get exchanges to come in and register with us. Why does this matter? Investors might prefer a spot Bitcoin ETP to other options, and we ought to care about what investors want. This kind of product, depending on how it's designed, could enable retail investors to gain exposure to Bitcoin through a securities product that because of the effective, ET, the effective arbitrage mechanisms that go with this kind of exchange traded product likely would track the, the, product, uh, the price of spot Bitcoin more closely. It likely would be inexpensive to manage such, such a fund, so fees would likely be low. It would sit conveniently in investors brokerage accounts alongside other securities that would allow investors to buy and sell their Bitcoin exposure the same way they buy and sell other exchange-listed products. Investment advisors also would find it easier to assist clients, um, and more and more investment advisors are hearing from clients uh, questions and interest in Bitcoin. So it, it would help them assist clients as well who are seeking to get exposure, and it would do so through a product that they're familiar with. 
Some people might object to retail exposure to Bitcoin and thus might oppose a product that makes it easier for retail investors to get exposure to Bitcoin. Making it harder to access Bitcoin, however, does not mean investors will not find other ways of doing so. Um, some do and, of course, can hold Bitcoin directly. Um, for the reasons I mentioned above, however, many investors want to get exposure to Bitcoin through the same way they get exposure to uh, in, in other areas of their securities portfolio. They have several options for doing so, but the methods um, can be a less direct and more expensive way to get exposure to Bitcoin. Um, so they can hold shares of a fund that has a small chunk of Bitcoin futures exposure. They can buy over-the-counter products that lack arbitrage mechanisms to keep the prices in line with underlying spot prices. They can buy a foreign spot-based ETP, which are generally unavailable or difficult for retail investors to obtain. They can buy a futures-based ETP, um, which, again, is, is, is likely to have some tracking um, difficulties and could be more expensive. So are we really serving investors by keeping them from a product that um, not only gives them the exposure they're trying to get, but does it in a way that is more convenient and perhaps less expensive? The commission thinks those arguments are irrelevant. So other people might object to a spot ETP on the ground that its advocates stand to gain a tremendous amount when a spot ETP launches. And that is uh, certainly true that many advocates of a spot ETP are Bitcoin investors who'd like to see the number go up. An ETP certainly could influence the price of Bitcoin, but Bitcoin markets do not always perform as people anticipate. A spot-based ETP, because of the ease with which it can be bought and sold, would be a way for many more voices to weigh in on the value of Bitcoin. Other types of ETPs have helped markets more efficiently incorporate information. Crit critics, therefore, can take comfort in the contribution that liquid, efficient markets play in working out the real value of assets, whether they are shares of a company, gold, or Bitcoin. Some Bitcoin hodlers might themselves object to the introduction of a Bitcoin ETP, one feature of a non-sovereign censorship-resistant mechanism for storing and transferring value is its ability to function outside of the traditional financial system. Why drag it inside TradFi and thus expose it to the meddling of incumbent uh, firms, financial firms, and the regulators that inev inevitably go with those firms? To these people, I say, the concern for liberty and personal autonomy that, that drives you to prefer we ought to fiat ought also cause you, cause you to reject um, a government arbitrarily limiting people's investment options. This, the commission's reluctance to approve a spot, a spot Bitcoin ETP is a piece with its, is of a piece with its more general approach to building a regulatory framework for crypto using standard regulatory processes. Instead, the commission has tried to cobble together a regulatory framework through enforcement actions. Enforcement is the appropriate tool to address the rampant fraud in the crypto space. But one-off enforcement actions that represent the first time the commission has addressed a particular issue publicly are not the right way to build a regulatory framework. For that, Congress gave us other tools, including authority to craft tailored exemptions and notice and comment rulemaking. Enforcement actions shortcut the regulatory process. So take an example. Um, the, the recent $100 million BlockFi settlement, um, that was a settlement that the, the commission and a number of state regulators um, brought. Uh, the commission's piece was $100 million. The commission in its settlement set out a path pursuant to which BlockFi could register under the Securities Act and obtain an exemption from the Investment Company Act. The specific path laid out in that settlement agreement crafted between BlockFi, one company, and the SEC, and keep in mind where the, where the leverage was in, in that negotiation, um, if successful, that's likely to become the standard for regulation of crypto lending. Other crypto lenders, users of those services, consumer advocates, and other interested parties were not part of those negotiations, but the results will likely affect them. <laughs> A preferable approach would have been, once we identified crypto lending as implicating the securities laws, to commence a rulemaking or invite crypto lenders to come in and discuss the appropriate path forward through careful use of our exemptive authority. 
We might similarly consider, rather than a reactive enforcement approach, a proactive regulatory approach with respect to non-fungible tokens, decentralized autonomous organizations, and decentralized exchanges. People doing things in crypto need to consider whether the laws, including securities laws, apply to what they do. For this to happen, though, in a more efficient and comprehensive way, the, co the Commission needs to provide a level of clarity that has heretofore been absent. The SEC could think through issues with people in the crypto community with an eye toward achieving our regulatory objectives in a pra pragmatic but effective way. By doing so, we could both facilitate good actors' compliance and importantly inhibit bad actors much more effectively than we do through the resource-intensive, often delayed enforcement approach that we've taken so far. We have a number of suggestions and examples of how to proceed that we can draw from. My colleague, Commissioner Crenshaw, set up a special mailbox through which she solicited, she solicited commentary about decentralized um, finance issues. Why not make that a commission-wide uh, request for input? J.W. Verrett, um, in a recent petition to the commission, recommended a starting point. Open a comment file so that people could discuss open questions about how to reconcile our securities laws with today's technologies. A small step, but a potentially important one. The Financial Accounting Standards Board, having heard a lot of concern about the current accounting standards for digital assets, recently opened a project to improve financial reporting for digital assets, including recognition, measurement, presentation, and disclosure. Another great example of, of the, the way to move forward in this area. A group of crypto lawyers has put together a number of concrete proposals, an iteration on a safe harbor proposal that I made, and also an exempt offering framework for digital assets that could be starting points for the commission to engage with, with uh, not only industry, but investors, advocates for investors, anyone else who's interested, we could have this open conversation. Recently, Commissioner, CFTC Commissioner Pham and I um, called for joint roundtables with the CFTC and the SEC. The two agencies have worked well together, sometimes not well, but sometimes we do have examples of working well together in the past where our jurisdiction bumps up against, um, our jurisdiction bump up against each other. This is another opportunity for us to do that. Congress is doing its thing, but we as regulatory agencies can be working together to give them a basis on which to, to consider how to move forward. Um, and I think this would be an extremely productive exercise and one that would, would certainly capitalize on people's willingness to work with us. And I think that came through in a recent rule proposal uh, in the comments in response to a recent rule proposal we, did, we, we put forth. That was a rule proposal where people looked at it and they were concerned that maybe this isn't sort of an indirect way to regulate certain aspects of, of um, DeFi and, and crypto. Um, and so people came in and they talked to us and it, it, they, by letter, they told us they're willing to work with us to figure out what the right approach is. But the right approach is not to um, adopt a rule without having the conversation that you need to have. People stand ready to work through myriad questions and regulatory concerns around crypto. Now all we have to do is extend, extend them a hand. So I'll conclude with just saying, although I've been quite critical of the SEC's approach, I'm optimistic that we can change course. The agency just celebrated its 88th birthday last week. There's no better age than 88 to start grappling with difficult, interesting regulatory questions around crypto to keep our minds sharp. Regardless of what one thinks of crypto, it's in both investors and the SEC's interest to take a more productive approach. Using tools that Congress has given us and drawing on public input, we can provide regulatory clarity, facilitate iterative experimentation. And, and that's an important part of it because things are gonna fail in this space, we all know that, but you gotta let people try to iterate on what others have done um, and move forward that way. And together we can also pursue bad actors in the crypto space. Again, having a regulatory framework in place is really important because lawyers out there have nothing to point at but enforcement actions. They don't, there's, they can't point to something to say this is the way you need to do something. Um, so I'm looking forward to the upcoming panel. I think we've got a great set of, of people on that panel who is going to be able to help us think through um, some productive steps forward. And, and I, uh, I look forward to uh, learning from what you all have to say. Thank you.
Anybody have any questions? Got a mic right here. Or, hey, uh, Verlau, why don't you come? Yeah. John Verlau, a FedSoc member, he written a book on George Washington recently um, that you should all read. Talks about how George Washington and used private column, money. A recent column, too, on George Washington and crypto and how he uh, used crypto cryptography with the Secret Six, so he would also be fascinated about it, I think. Um, Commissioner Peirce, um, uh, it's always a pleasure to hear your lively and informative writings and, spe and uh, spe uh, speeches. By the way, I'm with the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Um, uh, I um, would... Um, Two questions. One is technical. Um, uh, my colleagues and I are, were, were just talking about you know, just the definition of ETPs and ETFs. And in this space, so far, are all of the ETPs um, uh, uh, also ETFs, exchange-traded funds, because they don't believe the notes are, are there. And also, given recently what's happened with, um, uh, uh, like with Binance and Celsius and fr freezing freezing redemptions on some of the exchanges where you sort of you buy the uh, cryptocurrencies raw. What would be? I wanted to drill down a little about what would some of the in investor protection benefits would have of on having an ETP or ETF as an option. Are there are there guarantees of custody that they actually have to hold the crypto uh, the crypto um, or whatever asset there is required by required by uh, by law, not that it would you know guarantee against you know going down in price or anything, but that it would, that it would have to be there, you know, belonging to the in investors in the ETP or ETF. So to answer your first question, and this is complicated, people often say, you know, when is there going to be a spot Bitcoin or Bitcoin ETF is kind of the question, and what they're really asking is when is there going to be a spot based exchange traded product. So an ETF, an exchange traded fund, is something. It's, it's a type of investment company under the Investment Company Act of 1940, which comes with a whole suite of investor protections. That's something that I actually like to point to that as an example of how long, I mean, I've, I've said that our behavior with respect to crypto is uncharacteristic of the SEC, but there is a broader problem at the SEC in um, facilitating or, or setting the, the groundwork for innovation. Um, with respect to securities products. So exchange-traded funds were this huge innovation because it's, it's like a mutual fund, but it, it trades on an exchange. So you can buy and sell anytime you want, and it, it's a really effective way of keeping the price of the, the, the fund in line with what's in the underlying basket. That took us, it took us 25 years to get a rule for ETFs on the books. There are a lot of other things that happen in the interim, but I think that's an example of how long some of these things can take. Anyway, so the funds that have been um, have been approved, the, the futures-based funds, some of them, most of them have been under the, under the um, Investment Company Act, so they've been ETFs. Recently, there have been a couple that have gotten approved that are ETPs. They're this, these, these are funds that are under the Securities Act, um, and they do not have that suite of investor protections around them that, um, that an ETF would have. If there's going to be an approval of a spot a Bitcoin product, it will likely uh, be in the form of a 33 Act exchange traded product. Um, so to your question of what kind of investor protections does that afford, I mean, these are products that we have lots of experience with. And so um, their, you know, their disclosures around what the product is and how it operates, and so it's, it's, you know, it's a tried and true animal. Like, you know, it's it's something that people are comfortable with. So that's why I think um, there's a lot of comfort. I'm of course not going to talk about any particular um, companies or projects uh, and and what's what's going on there. But there would would there be? I mean, not like any any kind of you know guarantee the value, but like, like um, that. The, the promises as, as far as give the keeping uh, custody as far as the, the yeah I mean these are these are much more you know they're 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 institutional protections built around them that give the the retail investor a lot of comfort okay thank you. So, thank you so much thanks again. John yeah. um, madam commissioner thank you very much for for being here um, uh, cryptocurrencies have uh, have really taken off in a very low interest rate environment. Uh, we're now in a situation where uh, interest rates are starting to rise. Uh, the, uh, every indication is that they're gonna continue to, uh, to go uh, much higher. Uh, which raises this question, uh, 
how, what are the regulatory challenges that would be posed in, in, in regulating uh, Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies in a high, inter high interest rate environment? where for investors, uh, there's a, a relatively high opportunity cost of holding a non-interest bearing uh, uh, cryptocurrency, which in my opinion might lead some innovators to try and figure out some way of paying interest or something equivalent to interest uh, on a cryptocurrency in order to uh, retain investor interest in it. To what extent is, have you and others at the SEC started to think about uh, how you will regulate cryptocurrencies in a high interest rate environment? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think the, the thing I will come back to is to say that uh, our job is not to you know, tell you whether it's, it's something that you should invest in or not invest in, um, although we certainly put out lots of warnings about the, the risks and volatility and so forth. But I think where, where it would come in is the question of how, how are you making disclosures around um, around a product that has Bitcoin in it. What are the risks that you're laying out? Um, and you know, obviously there's a lot of, a lot of thinking going around how, how um, you, can, you can make a crypto product that's interest bearing. I mean, there, there are existing products that are, that are doing that now, but I think that that's the answer is it would, it would be through disclosure of risks rather than telling people they can't, uh, can't participate in products that have Bitcoin or other crypto. In them. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, hi, Commissioner. You have, uh, th well, thank you for your talk today. You have also, in addition to being critical of the SEC about um, exchange traded products, you've also been critical about ESG issues. And I was wondering if you saw any confluence of these two issues coming together. For instance, I could imagine. Um, the, the SEC putting out a rule about diversity uh, requirements for exchanges or for tokens or even sort of um, environmental disclosures uh, related to proof of work for Bitcoin to sort of uh, uh, take that out of the marketplace and make everything else, uh, make everything proof of stake. So I was wondering if you saw any confluence between uh, ESG issues and the crypto market in general. Well, I think the, the ESG um, term, you know, environmental social governance or everything that sounds good, you know, um, can encompass so many different things, right? And, and so what I think you're putting your finger on is that as in this area where one of the things that I, that I have, you know, have tried to push back against in my role as a commissioner is merit regulation because we're not a merit regulator. Some other securities regulators are merit regulators. We are not. That's not what Congress told us to do. And there has been, over my time there at the SEC, there have been numerous instances in which we've tried to use our authority that's designed as disclosure authority to be merit based regulation, substantive regulation. And so um, I can see that we could use our disclosure authority in ways that would be designed to um, you know, f get a focus on particular areas in crypto. You know, the energy one is, is a common one that people talk about now. You know, people think that energy shouldn't be used on on um, Bitcoin mining, for example, and so you could use a disclosure rule to try to highlight it, but to actually try to stop people from using, you know, from, from doing Bitcoin mining. And so certainly we're seeing that on the climate side where we put out a, a proposal um, that is a disclosure proposal, but is certainly at least appears to me, I should say, um, and again, we're in a comment period, so I welcome anyone's comments. Tell me I'm wrong about this. But when we put in the rule and we, you know, we say, well, we realize it's going to be really hard to measure your scope three greenhouse gas emissions. One solution would be for you to, to make a different product. You know, what the, the, the SEC, a disclosure regulator, is suggesting to people that they make a different product so they don't have to make a particular disclosure to us, that's a remarkable statement. And I think it's, it's, it's an area that people really need to be focused on. Um, the, the misuse of a very effective disclosure framework to affect people's behavior substantively, that's just not our role. 
And if it does start to become our role, we're going to become a hyper-politicized regulator. And that breaks my heart because the SEC has a really important role to play in keeping capital markets functioning effectively. The capital markets in the United States are the best in the world, and there's a reason that they're the best in the world. And injecting politics into everything that we do is a terrible idea, and I hope that we're able to resist the urge, whether it's in the crypto area or in um, green finance or any other area. Markets are wonderful at solving problems. We just have to let them disclose what they're doing and then let them figure it out. They can solve problems in ways that we're, we're as regulators, and even anyone, any one person in this room wouldn't be able to solve problems. It's when you put people together in the capital markets that you get the, the, the brilliant combination of the money and the, the innovative ideas. They come together and they produce things none of us could on our own imagine. So I will uh, end with that note. I think it's fair to say that uh, crypto has a formidable tiger mom. So thank you, Commissioner, for that great discussion. Appreciate it.